Welcome to All Waves Considered. I'm your host, Brenda Stokes. And I'm your host, Julius Bichani. And we're talking about two days of surf, 26th and the 27th. Yes, the 26th was the great big day. I was working out here in the studio and we were watching the wind swirl around and and waiting for the offshores and they finally hit around noontime for real, rushed in to look at the camera and it was still quite very large. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go out to the beach till later to watch the big action from the pier. In Pensacola, we had a fairly similar situation. We had the onshore winds in the morning time and then they cleaned up after we had a storm move through and they were just gigantic waves on the outside <laughs> it took me a while to go out there i was scared of it <laughs> you should be scared of it because there were a few injuries that day one broken board that i know about mm-hmm. and actually the next day was when the more serious injuries were that's right yeah the, the next morning anyway it was still pitchy mm-hmm. kind of pitchy and the wind was blowing a little bit too hard to drop in sometimes it would hold you up at the lip when i paddled out that day i got to witness a lot of fun wipeouts uh-huh. <laughs> that I say fun only because most of the people were young there was a few old ones which yeah. you worry about but mm-hmm. I stayed out of that zone yeah went to a gentler break but from where I sat more inside I could see the action when the big sets came they would break further out and when the hang-ups would happen they were quite spectacular they were <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah okay so that's fine for the for that day unless there's anything else you want to talk about no just that it it still is fun, and this surfing addiction is is quite the fun lifestyle. <laughs> That's all I can say for fifty five years surfing. Uh, okay, can you tell me more about that? So I met a guy named Pasco, right? Yes, uh, Pasco at the Gibson. beach, and he told me that he was a lifeguard. I want to say in like seventy two or seventy three, and that he took your job when you left it. I left that, I did that job in the summer of 72 and 73, Mm -hmm. so he must have come on in 74, because I worked with Mark Golden, and um, then I got a job offer at Fort Pickens, working for higher pay and better hours and (laughs) more structure with Charlie Schuler. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yes. Can we even go further back? So tell me about your childhood. Did you grow up in this area? My childhood was an oblivious child in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Okay. From the memories I remember, I barely remember Louisiana, but my father was retiring. So mm-hmm. he retired out of Biloxi when I was in first grade from Keesley, Gulfport or Keesler Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. So I went to first grade near Ocean Springs. And there was a lot of art in first grade. Mm-hmm. And then we moved immediately for him to get his master's out of, Had- out of uh, Southern at Hattiesburg. Mm-hmm. We lived there three years. Then when he graduated, we moved to an island in South Florida, Anna Maria, which was like Gilligan's Island to, uh-huh. to us kids. And there was my brother and myself and my sister. That's where I was first exposed to this walking on water thing that these guys were doing. Because from our venue, looking out, the sand jutted out a little bit. So from where we were sitting, it looked like these guys were gliding across the sand. And when we first came up on them and we we came around the point, then we could see they were surfing a little point break. Mm -hmm. And of course, on Anna Maria Island, on the Gulf side, there wasn't a lot of surf for them either. But this happened to be a nice little offshore day. After that, it was rubber rafts. Uh-huh. You know, we, we got the, the rubber rafts, and, and that's all we could do. And a hurricane came. Mom said, oh, my God, we got to go back to Mississippi. And the whole family was like, nope, nope, <laughs> we're staying. So he compromised with my mother and moved up to Fort Walton. Mm. And they were a little more inland, mm-hmm. not really away from hurricanes. But then the guy across the street happened to be a surfer. And he was going to talk to Hatchie High School, and I was still in middle school. And he would, his mother would make him take me and another neighbor to the beach to get rid of us, I think, uh-huh. so that the two moms could hang out. <laughs> and he was really nice. They'd take their guitars and their surfboards, and when they would come in, they would push us on the waves for a little while and then make us push e- push each other while they played guitars and you know flirted with girls and stuff and then the end of the day we leave and next weekend seems we do the same things mm. mom got me a surfboard not too long after that from a guy named doodle harris who 
happened to be a quite colorful character out of Fort Walton, but he had a surf shop on Highway 98. He had surfboards in Jimmy's newsstand because supposedly that was a relative. His father, maybe. We never got to interview Doodle before <laughs> he passed, but mm-hmm. he has a beautiful gravestone mm. that has a wave on it. That board was a con, C-O-N-N model. Never heard of it. I guess my mother took a picture of my brother and I when I was 12 years old out on Navarre Beach with it. The bridge had opened. Not, I guess the bridge had just opened because mm-hmm. I think it was built and first opened in 68. Okay. So it must have been right around 68, 69. Mm-hmm. But it was brand new. The beaches looked huge because there was a lot of sand and they built a cas- not a casino but a pavilion mm-hmm. out there. And that was the pavilion that Pasco, I guess Pasco was there must have been 74 Mm -hmm. because i was 72 and three beautiful pavilion which the hurricanes took after a while and can you tell me about maybe some of your early surf memories we're talking about your neighbor who would go with you a a memory from that time period we didn't have the long boards too long mama had a rambler Mm -hmm. and one of the neighbors had a station wagon so they would take turns taking kids and dumping them out on Fort Walton, sometimes we would be around the Tower Beach area, and then mm-hmm. sometimes we would be further down Surf Dweller, more towards Navarre at a place called Surf Dweller mm-hmm. on Okaloosa Island. I surfed with a brother from another mother who lived a few houses down, Art Roan, uh-huh. great character, and, and my brother captured us when we were probably, he was probably 14, I was probably 15. For my birthday, Mama took me to the first surf shop, not the first surf shop, but probably the first shortboard mm-hmm. surf shop, Howie Jones ran right at the end of the bridge going into Shalimar mm-hmm. on the Fort Walton side, yep. was a surf shop that sat right on the water there, a Howie surf shop, and they had gotten in a bean glass slipper it was the Bing model, mm-hmm. and it was a little 7'6", concave bottom, which was kind of cool, and single fin. That was heaven for a long time, and that was the end of the long boards for us. We dumped the long boards, and short boards really started coming in. They built the new high school, Fort Walton Beach High School. When we were doing double session at Choctaw, which would have been in 69... 70, 71, 72. We, sometimes we would have the mornings we wouldn't have to report to school till like noon. It, se- it just seemed like so many kids at school surfed. Uh-huh. You know, everybody piled in together and went. And then when, when we got our real school, our own school in Fort Walton Beach High School, we were the first class, first graduating class, which graduated in 72. But they had a whole, whole entourage of surfers there. You know, there was Sandy Lickhauer and And a crow, you know, everybody loved Greg Ammons. And, you know, there was another guy who was a switch foot. It didn't matter which way. He didn't even know it either. His name was Morgan, something Morgan. If he'd take off going left, he'd stand up facing the wave. If he took off going right, he'd stand up yeah. facing the wave. <laughs> and and it was it was the dad gummedest thing we'd ever seen because he didn't have to worry about a backside style. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's he was front side cool. all the time. <laughs> yes, and and those were fun days. And and Mark Rush and the old uh, guys that were a year older than us, they were they were at the Choctaw scene. But we all surfed like surf dweller all the way down to nco club all the way to cove we even had a break much like much like amazon's Mm -hmm. which is panama city pass the wave at the cove was in between the jetties the same way that the the pass is in in panama city Mm. you know we'd have to go across destin bridge onto the okaloosa island out to the end and then walk to the cove Mm. and you could see it breaking from the bridge which was the cool thing because you know you knew it was up you didn't have to go all the way there you could actually (laughs) see all the people in the water and yeah yeah, if you wanted to park Mm. you could you could swim across the the way the paddle across the way there which we did later in life because it got to be no parking but the cove was long gone it was only there a few years before The bright idea to put a finger jetty came, and Mm. the finger jetty destroyed that beautiful break inside the pass. It started breaking on the right-hand side for a little while. Mm -hmm. And every now and then you can catch a wave if you're there during the right conditions. Uh But not being a kid anymore, we just not seem to have the time that we used to have to go do things like that. Plus, it's gotten so crowded that last time we went to Panama City Pass, it took us three hours to get back. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a happy no. time you know so so i heard only take interstate yeah you know to, to get to the past now which mm-hmm. we will do next time joey dillard told me that you were you ended up being a east coast surf champion so i'm, I'm curious I, I feel like there's two things going on one that you're a woman what i'm assuming is a, was at the time a mostly male dominated currently is male dominated sport yeah and and two it was something that you ended up 
being good at and pursuing. So can you it, tell me about that path? Well, I guess Yancey the third was responsible for that because when I was 15, maybe even 14, I don't remember, 15 probably, just 15, entered one of his contests in Pensacola mm-hmm. uh, in the novice division and happened to place second, I believe, mm-hmm. over some of the guys, which was all right. <laughs> was probably embarrassing, you know. But it was novice division, so who yeah. cares? And mm-hmm. and then Yancey put me on his team yeah. of surfers, which I was honored to be on. That was awesome. And even when his little surf shop burnt down there, the one that was before you go over the bridge, his first surf shop, we had a bake sale got all of the school together and had a bake sale to, I think we raised a whole $80 towards his, <laughs> <laughs> towards his fire sale or yeah. whatever it was. But, but it started there. And then when I was really young, he took us out to California mm-hmm. and Malibu. And that was my first experience with real competitors, mm-hmm. but still all amateur stuff. The amateur and the profession, what was to become professionals, were still mixed together because Mar- Margot Oberg was supposed to be there, but Rail's son's sister was there, Nell's son, and of course, you know, Ben Ipa's crew and a whole mm. bunch of Barry Kanaya Puni and a whole bunch of famous people we'd seen in Surfing Magazine. And it was a great experience, but that's when we met with the tricksters because they would soap some of the better Gulf Coast surfers boards, put soap on them (laughs) that looks like wax. And then for myself, the little girl, like I got into the semifinals and she said, well, let's go surf down the beach here. So the contest was being held on the point. And then we went on in towards the cove there. And I said, well, you know, I don't know when they're going to call my heat. And she says, oh, they're not going to call our heat, but she wasn't in my heat. And we were down there surfing, and I kept looking up, seeing girls going into the water. Uh -uh. And so my brain never did think, she's tricking me, you know. And when I ran into the beach, my heat was already like five minutes left of it. And they're like, oh, you missed your heat. And and I probably wouldn't have got out of it anyway, but it's the fact that I really thought that I should have been surfing in it. And Mm -hmm. they didn't, the other heats were full, so I didn't get to go to another heat, and that was the end of it. We had a great time, learned a great lesson, and... (laughs) And then we went to the East Coast Championships. Mm -hmm. I think the first one I entered, I got third. And then the next year, I got first, Mm -hmm. which was really nice. It was in, I don't know, 74 maybe. Okay. How old would that have made you? 19. Okay. I think I was Mm -hmm. about 19. Later, our business, we made trophies. Mm -hmm. So for the NSSA, I would take trophies over there to Todd Holland's mother, Carol Holland, who ran later ran a travel agency. I don't know if she did at that time or not for exotic surf trips and stuff. Mm -hmm. Her and her son, Dak, and then Todd was on the tour. At that time, Todd wasn't on the tour. They were really young. She ran the NSSA, and we made trophies. Our business made trophies for the turkey trot and all these different contests. So while we were over there, I would surf in those contests, and I placed pretty good. And I think I was already not in the girls' division. I might have been, no, I was in the middle-aged women's division, so it was 30 and above. Mm -hmm. So I was in my younger 30s. The girl that was supposed to go couldn't Mm -hmm. uh, out to California. So she called me up and asked if I could go. And I was like, oh, wow, this would be great. You know, here we go. I'll try again. Happened to place first in the 30 and above Mm -hmm. age group. So there was 29 and under 30 and above. Mm -hmm. You know, that was quite fun for me because I'd always wanted to do that again and and Mm -hmm. really never didn't have the opportunity. And you took a 10 year gap and then won again. (laughs) Yeah. And then it it well, it was on a left break. So that was really nice. And, Mm -hmm. and then it qualified to get to go to the worlds. But at the time they were holding the worlds, my sister came down with a very large tumor Mm -hmm. that was in her abdomen Mm -hmm. and the, and the surgery and that kind of coincided and, I was probably too chicken to go over there and surf those big waves anyway. Where was it? <laughs> I think they were holding it this side of sunset. Okay, yeah. So there was a smaller break there. Uh-huh. I can't really remember, but I don't believe it was sunset. Mm-hmm. They said it could be sunset if the conditions were right. But mm-hmm. back, time, mm-hmm. back then, they really didn't push the women out in giant things. And, and at that time, it was still amateur. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no professional, even Margot Oberg. I mean, I mean, nobody won anything except maybe some money, sponsorships. You mm-hmm. know, it, it was just probably until the mid-80s, I think, that bigger, bigger prizes came in. And then not until too awfully recently, the girls now can afford to be on the circuit. Mm-hmm. But 10 years ago, it was still tough for yeah. them. But 
now that they got surf camps and surf pools and and all these things to practice on, you know, the girls are catching up rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I see women surfing who are doing awesome aerials and just awesome things. Some of them that don't compete, some that do compete, some, you know, some women I've never heard of that compete Mm -hmm. that are just, there's so many good, good ones now. It's like, it's, it's so wonderful to see. And I was watching some French movie not too long ago of this girl, who's got a kid who was surfing this really heavy break over a ledge and she had it so wired that she never fell down. And when she would take off, she would get right in the trough where it's sucking off the ledge and ride that thing and then come up to the top when it would pass one ledge and get ready for the next ledge it would hit. And then it would just bowl over and you'd see nothing but the tip of her board. And then she'd come flying out and she'd go up and there was three, looked like three ledges Mm -hmm. like into a cove. Yeah. God, it just, it's just, Makes you want to be young again. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and can you tell me what it felt like, what what surfing felt like to you or, or what the competition felt like? I want to know, like, your internal process. Well, I went to a <laughs> kidney contest over on the East Coast to support the two brothers. I can't remember their last name. I went over there for that and surfed in two divisions, shortboard and longboard. Mm-hmm. And it was really hard to, to get into the competition because I don't take it seriously at all. And I never really kind of did. I did, you do when you're young, but then when you get older, it's like you like to sit back and watch the younger ones. And they they didn't have an age division for the finals mm-hmm. I, that I can remember because I was competing against a really young, some young girls. But I wanted to get into the finals, which I did, but I didn't want to play all the games that I was witnessing. But because I've seen them all over the years, you I kind of knew. You could avoid them. <laughs> yeah, and watching the pros, you know, what happens to the pros and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was watching how, since there was four women in a heat, how they cut you off and they come over and they send one of the lesser girls who doesn't surf as good over there to ha- kind of harass you while yeah. they're catching all the good <laughs> oh, waves. And, and 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 since I seen that, it was real easy for me to sit on top of her mm-hmm. and then get priority under her, mm-hmm. you know, which I did quite a few times. I managed to get in the finals, but, you know, it it just felt wrong. Mm -hmm. to win over these young people who it meant so much to Mm. them that I couldn't get serious about uh, about winning I mean I surf my best it's not like I was trying to lose but I couldn't get into the competition yeah because I wasn't into that it it wasn't like I was going to get a truck or a car or a hundred thousand dollars or something Uh like that you you weren't out for blood and you empathized with them and that's where you're like you kind of wish that they had had it yeah because (laughs) this little 16 year old was so good and then her little friend was probably you know maybe 19 18 19 and Mm -hmm. you know the little 16 year old was really good Mm -hmm. she walked that board all over and i'm not a walk i like to shortboard my longboard Mm -hmm. and ricky carroll builds these awesome boards that act like a short board but they're a long board you know that's the way i rode Mm -hmm. i wasn't into the walking stuff but i respected that's what it was Mm -hmm. and and i just kind of sat back a lot and watched Uh you know and i did that again at another contest that was held here because i can't get into the competing against if they don't have an age division which should be required Mm -hmm. you know these these kids need to progress Mm -hmm. because it meant so much to me to progress and I remember how my heart was broken when I was tricked and didn't get into that semifinal Uh yeah you know it's it means a lot to them and it should and and we should promote them Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. and and the older you get the more spiritual surfing becomes you know Mm -hmm. being being out there with nature and all these wonderful things that happen and I need to protect my eyes more like Brian Malone yeah going to get me some of those c-specs one of these days before I go blind yeah, see a link in the comments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you lean into the, the spiritual side of surfing for me? Oh, I love to go out by myself now. And since since my hip and my back and my hip aren't cooperating enough for me to get up fast enough before you're in the trough, mm-hmm. a J.B. Sluter had, had lent me this little sponge board. Boogie boards are too, with fins and all that stuff, boogie boards is, is kind of too hard of a thing to do. Mm-hmm. And when you get older, you don't want your feet flopping around with those fins on them. So he said, try this out. I thought, wow, this is great. This is fun. So I got one of my own. I got a little 510 board from Hawaii, one of the famous kids over there, Michael Ho. Michael Ho's son, I believe. But yeah, Mason. Mason Ho. Yeah. Yes, it's a little Mason Ho board that mm-hmm. got got out of Interlight, and 
then now I've got a bigger board for smaller days and then the small board for bigger days. And Mm -hmm. they're sliders. And then I found this thing without fins. I started studying these boards because I have found them to be so much fun because the spiritual thing is the wave Mm -hmm. itself. And everything, of course, that flies by you underwater and mm-hmm. over the water and in the water. And the wave itself is kind of like each one is its own little thing. You've got to predict which way it's coming, where it's coming. Is it going to pop pop off? Is it going to bounce off the pier this way? Or if it's coming from the west, which, which projectory is it going to take? And you know how they bounce out there. And finally, if you line one upright and you get that wave, it's really, really something and and the closer you are to the wave face can watch the the uh, water come over you not that i'm in the tube a lot Mm because i'm not but i do stay right there where the wave is cresting you know Mm -hmm. and pitching out and on smaller days especially i'm going to get those those brian malone goggles i heard they they're making uv goggles that Mm -hmm. swimmers use and that way you don't have to shut your eyes so much Mm -hmm. you know and some other guy with a boogie board said get you some goggles and and um, so you can see, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're inside and you can see better. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking, okay, that'll be fun. But this sliding thing has gotten to be really cool. One day last spring, my back got better and my hip got better for a period of time there. And, and so I was taking advantage of it surfing. And it was really fun to be back surfing again. But on this one particular day, I was getting bored because the wave was just, you know, it, was, it seemed to be the same wave over and over and over. And so I mm-hmm. ran in and got the, the little SpongeBob. I call it, and <laughs> and you can hang up at the top of the lip on the SpongeBob and go really, really fast, like dropping down and then going back up to the lip and hanging up at the lip, mm-hmm. you know, on particular days when there's uh, light offshores that aren't blowing really bad, mm-hmm. long walls. Mm-hmm. And it just got to be fun because you do it on your surfboard. Each wave is great, but you've already done that 10 times. Mm-hmm. So you go in and you get that little slider board, you know, and you can do new tricks like dropping it backwards. Uh-huh. Like you drop in and then you go back up to the lip and you can pull the fins out just a little bit enough to slide down the face and mm-hmm. then get going again and then get back up to the top, you know, and jank the fins out a little more and just fun things that you learn after you. It's about three years, four years I've been riding that thing. Mm-hmm. It's fun. I can't tell you. I'm trying to get all these old people to say, <laughs> I can't get up anymore. And I'm thinking there's a whole new life for you out there, you know. And when you feel good, you can surf. And when you don't feel good, you can get on that thing. And I like to go off by myself, too. As my son, you know, he doesn't surf crowds. And mm-hmm. and uh, some other friends I have don't surf crowds. So we go off and get a wave that's not as good as the one by the pier. Mm-hmm. But it's every bit good enough to enjoy. I mean, right. they're really good waves. But uh-huh. it's not like the pier you can judge them so great by the pier and other places where there's a natural hole i don't know what was down there so i think john russell told me they were old pine maybe from pine tree uh, roots that might be uh, kind of petrified or something Mm. down there Mm -hmm. but there's something that holds the sand and then there's these natural troughs that stay in the same place like there's one on navarre beach that's just down from the pier towards the west about every three or four years we'll get an incredible break there Mm -hmm. and and john russell has it on film he was supposed to take a video of my son and i and i told him to come back tomorrow four o'clock you know that place was going to be going off again unfortunately john who i love dearly is brought oh let's see who he brought he brought his whole crowd that that normally let's see to your secret spot joey dillard yeah. <laughs> you know johnny green i think robin martin <laughs> and we were i was like john really i think i thought we were gonna do a video of my son and i uh-huh. and he's like well you know how they follow me around <laughs> i'm like yeah okay but i love all those people uh-huh. i love all those people all of them mm-hmm. you know the, the just surfing with them over the years you get to know them and you, you their idiosyncrasies yeah. and which way they might take. And after they get too many, you're like, okay, this one's mine. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> some of the younger ones act like we did when we were young. Which is what? This is the only wave left in the Gulf of Mexico oh, got you. And, and it's, it's mine. mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Battle back out and the next one's the same way. Uh-huh. You're like, okay, you've had three in a row. It's in my turn. Yeah. So I'm taking off behind or in front. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> which one yeah. you want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with <laughs> so, that's funny i like eh, that <laughs> it is fun well you can intimidate kids and then there's the ones that i guess when i was that age all old people on long boards i don't know we just probably made fun of them a lot uh-huh. and 
But it seems like the younger kids these days, I guess, they're not as bad. They don't seem as bad, maybe, as we were. I don't know. Oh, I'm sure they'd be rem- happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then when you sit and talk to them, like, I wanted to surf the inside the other day, but there yeah. was there was a whole bunch of them. Mm-hmm. And and the, the surf, I managed to pick off two, but there was a whole bunch of kids there. And, and yeah. I just had fun watching them and everything. But at first, they didn't want to talk to me. Mm-hmm. You know, cause who's this old woman out here with this hat on and this yeah. sponge board? Mm-hmm. You know, you side up to them a little bit and you start talking and then you start talking a little bit more. And then some of them are getting great waves. So you compliment their waves. And then pretty soon they, they're kind of like, well, I guess she's going to sit out here. So we might as well talk to her. Mm, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> she's not going to shut up. So we, <laughs> we might as well yak. It's fun. We can intimidate kids now. You know, I'll be 70 years old, so I can say that if I want to. You can. I feel okay with it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you know. You know, it's fun. It, it is fun, and and I enjoy watching all the new surfers and mm-hmm. and all the people progress over the years, and then they move away, and then they come back, and these kids too, like they'll go off to college and then come back, and they don't look like they did before, mm. but you know, you've seen them somewhere. Uh-huh. They look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but bigger. <laughs> That's fun too. You know, some of them going off, join the military, and then come back here. What I'd like to know is your favorite surf memory. memory. The, f- the favorite memory I would have to have would be sitting out in the middle of Panama City Pass and the big day was gone. I usually don't go on the big days because it's too crowded. So the day after or the day after that, usually the pass will break for three days. So this was the second or the probably the second day. Mm-hmm. And it was maybe ways to chest. And I was sitting out there all by myself and my husband was fishing. He had a boat and he, he goes on fishing this red hat floated by and I picked it up and put it on my head so they could see me I'm like I guess this was meant to be it was a Yamaha (laughs) red hat yeah and and uh, that was really cool and then other times I just remember John Russell sitting on the jetty there would be just me and and uh, another friend Suzanne sometimes it would be just all girls out there from Mm -hmm. Mr. Surf Surf Shop his wife and two girls one of them has a boat and those kind of days where it's not crowded, people in the water are, are really good, or just days by yourself, mm-hmm. like the past, because you don't get the past too many days by yourself. And I remember I was surfing it by myself one time when the girls had left, and I thought, no, I'm not done yet. And and I'm thinking, God, I wish somebody else was out here, because it was a little bit too big, not mm-hmm. too big, but big. it was getting bigger on the sets. Mm-hmm. And Michael Litvak paddled yeah. out, uh-huh. you know, and I was like, I'm so happy to see you. Yeah. <laughs> I think perfect, you're talking about your favorite waves, they're always long, long point break Mm -hmm. lefts, Mm -hmm. and the favorite one on the West Coast would have been um, Swami's, because it's a perfect right. You never fall down, you never get your hair wet, and the people are all Swami friendly, Uh (laughs) I guess, because that golden domes are up there. It's just a whole cool Ah. vibe, you Uh know, and there was some clay on the beach that I got to get and make some pots out of of, um, their clays, and... And then there's Oceanside Museum, the California Surf Museum. We went to all four museums on the West Coast, Mm -hmm. but one that was way on up north. So Mm -hmm. that's the only one we didn't get to. Got to put some flowers out where um, Mark Fu passed at Mavericks. Mm -hmm. Got to meet Jeff Clark. That was really cool. He just happened to be there waiting on an airplane, waiting on his family to get on an airplane Mm -hmm. later. And it was a perfect time to sit on the bench and, and yak and and when I walked out to put flowers, he told me where Mark Fu's grave was because I, I mean, his memorial because I couldn't find it. Mm-hmm. But he said it was now three memorials there, mm. the same one. Mm-hmm. So I had flowers that he'd helped me get. We went and took them out there and met um, his, you know, Jeff Clark says, well, the surf's up today and, and so-and-so's out there uh, teaching a kid. And they happened to be walking in right when we got to the memorial. You know, so that was really cool, too. But just things like, you know, getting to meet your heroes and and that's par- all part of surfing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just when you, I think when you get older, you want to meet more of them. I hate that I never met. Um, I did meet um, Noel, Greg Noel, because mm-hmm. Yancey took us to the East Coast when we were young. But he was a long boarder. Uh-huh. And all of us, like 15 year olds, were they, we, we, he wanted us all to get it, to, to be there to meet Greg Knoll, listen to Greg Knoll. And, 
and I never remember caring. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was like I think it was Rob Fink told me that people made fun of longboarders and stuff. Of like course that. they did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we were young and, and um what do you call it? Full of ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Short borders. <laughs> yeah, we were really cool. <laughs> Had our new bangs and glass slippers and whatever the heck else there was. Yeah. Hansons. I think Charlie Schuler had a really cool Hanson platypus, maybe, or a 50-50, or he's, there's a picture of him waxing it somewhere. That's, uh-huh. that's a really cool shot. The only thing I, I didn't talk to you about, this, and this is, this is just coming popping in my head, is the experience of being a woman in, in, in this sport. I don't know if that's oh, something you yeah, want to talk yeah. about at all, or yeah. it's something, w- was that a big part of the experience? Yes, I can tell you some women things. Let's see, Mama's first little bathing suit she got for me. <laughs> um, after before I started wearing shorts, mm-hmm. because there was no girl clothes for surfing, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. you know. And and in the magazines, most of the girls wore doggers. And and back then, the, I just heard that term yesterday from Joey. Yeah, and the doggers were short, you know. And <laughs> and um, that was really nice. And so, uh, but Mom had gotten me this bathing suit when I was thirteen, I think twelve or thirteen. And she used to like take me shopping and buy these clothes I never wore. Mm-hmm. But the bathing suit, I didn't have a choice because I didn't have anything else. And and so right after losing parts of it and yeah. and it just not being surfing comfortable, I just went and kind of made my own top mm-hmm. and then bought some doggers. Mm. And, and that was forever surfing then. Yeah. As far as guys, gosh, all the high school guys were so sweet, nice. Everybody was so great. But every now and then, I'd, when I was 15, I got my feelings hurt by this older surfer. And I don't know if he's pulling my leg or not, but he said some really gangster things like, you know, women are supposed to be on the beach and blah, blah, blah. And, uh-huh. and, and you know, I was young and stupid and didn't know how to talk back and, and just kind of like paddled away from him. But mm. then I'd be around him again. And, and um, he just kept making derogatory comments. And, and the ones who are joking after you get 16, 17, you know, you still kind of hear and you get looks and things like that because there basically there was no other women in the water. There was a girl from Tallahassee that would come every now and then, and Lisa Lisa Wakely Muir. She was here till she moved away, but only when I was like fifteen, I think. And but but mostly it was just me, mm-hmm. and and growing up in Fort Walton and and um, it was the older surfers, never the never the my age surfers. Mm-hmm. You know, you just kind of fit in with them, and you're just another one of the crowd and yeah. and another surfer. No, not really. Now it's so acceptable because there are so many girls that surf. But back then, it was very limited. Very limited. Thank you for watching All Waves Considered. This is your outgoing host, Brenda Stokes. If you would come down to Navarre Beach to surf again, you just make sure that you give me waves.